Very important. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are recording this uh, webinar, so uh, it will be available at www.nyimapinvasive.org after we wrap up. Uh, thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, we're going to get started about now. It's 12.16. Um, so again, for folks who just joined us, um, please make sure you turn off your audio. Um, you know, it is a little distracting, so we want everyone to be able to hear, so please put yourself on mute. Uh, turn off your uh, video camera as well. Um, remove the audio, fun uh, excuse me, the chat function, so you can't ask questions, a little distracting for those presenters. So uh, I will reinstall it at the end, so if anyone wants to chat in the meantime, or you can um, turn your audio on at the end to ask a question. Um, but I think we're ready to go. Um, again, thank you guys for joining us, so let's get started. Okay. Okay. Again, just a reminder for folks, please turn off your audio. We're hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, so again, please turn it off while we get started. Okay, so thank you guys. Um, this is a webinar regarding the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge. So uh, we're starting right now about 12.15ish, and we'll go into about 1.30, and we'll have some time afterwards to do a um, IMAP support hours, so for people who might have questions regarding the IMAP invasive uh, database, we have all a bunch of staff here who can answer your questions as they come in. Um, so I believe everyone can hear me. I think we're good to go. So I'm going to move forward, kind of explaining what this challenge is about. Um, and again, this is Emma Antolis from New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and we'll be joined by Anna Dobson from Yale University, who will talk about um, uh, jumping worm, and we have Jennifer Dean, who will talk about IMAP invasive, and that will end with us talking about water chestnut, which I will cover, and then we'll have that tech hour at the end and, and answer any questions you may have about water chestnut or jumping worm or IMAP. All right, so the goals of the webinar today, um, we would love you to leave this knowing how to utilize the IMAP database and make observations, um, how to identify jumping worm and water chestnut, and then use that knowledge that you learn to participate in the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge, which is July 5th through the 19th. Um, a quick outline of the presentation, so if you guys um, feel that you want to jump out um, at any time, if you just want to stay for the jumping worm, if you just want to stay for the IMAP part, this is kind of our basic outline. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to update this slide with Jennifer Dean's information. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll follow that pretty closely. So again, if you would like to um, join in or you know take off for a little bit, I understand some people are joining this for certain um, species ID or IMAP information. So come and go as you please. All right, so a quick rundown about invasive species. Um, they are non-native plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that cause harm to the environment, the economy, and human health. Um, and we in New York are really fortunate in that we have these really great things called PRISMs, or Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, um, that were created to address the threats uh, that invasive species cause across New York State. So if you're familiar, unfamiliar with the um, PRISM system, uh, we have eight of them across New York State. Um, so we have Western New York PRISM, um, we have the Finger Lakes PRISM, uh, we have the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario PRISM, uh, the APIP PRISM, which is Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Uh, we have the Capital District, uh, excuse me, Capital Mohawk PRISM. We have the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership, uh, the Lower Hudson Prism, and LISMA, which is the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. I think I got that all correct. Um, so if you are curious which prism you are, um, please visit our website. Um, if you go to uh, dec.ny.gov, uh, you can find all this information and find what prism you're in. Um, because this is really important for um, our mapping challenge, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so what do prisons do? Um, they do various management activities, they implement prevention programs, uh, they conduct surveillance and mapping of infestations, do early detection and rapid response of invasives, um, habitat restoration and monitoring, 
stakeholder education, uh, volunteer recruitment and training, and they actually act as a regional communication hub. Um, so what does this mean for you guys? So all this information um, with using IMAP um, and uh, you know participating in this invasive species mapping challenge is that uh, the prison leaders and a lot of other natural uh, resources uh, folks in the field can use this um, data and um, make management decisions and, and use it as a tool. So um, this is a fun little way, a uh, fun little competition to incorporate, you know, uh, uh, filling in those data gaps in IMAPs invasive, uh, which is a statewide database. Um, so, uh, you know, it's fun and it gets folks out there and participating um, and, you know, you can win prizes, but it's also super uh, good data for our prison leaders to know as well as other folks in the field. Um, so today our focus is on water chestnut and Asian jumping worm. Um, so these are actually two underreported um, species uh, that we have a severe lack of data in the IMAP database. Um, so again, this challenge is to uh, get more folks out there on the ground reporting. Um, it's a little friendly competition, so um, you know <laughs> you can compete for prizes, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So why are we focusing on these two specific species? So like I said, there's a severe gap in data for both species. Um, water chestnut, um, we definitely have a lack of data, and you can see, um, I'll follow up with a map in some of the issues uh, and, and lack, you know, uh, regionally, especially in central New York, we don't have a lot of data, and we are unsure if we actually have water chestnut present or if it's just has not been reported. Um, so, you know, this is great information for our PRISM leaders to, to uh, find out because they could then find small, easily manageable populations. So water chestnut um, is easily pulled, um, and when it's in small populations, you can kind of really tackle that. Um, it's not it's such a huge issue. Uh, so if you see uh, the photos to the right, um, that's kind of a smaller uh, infestation on the top. And what we're doing, we want this data so we don't let the bottom photo happen, this mass, uh, dense mat of uh, water chestnut that's almost too much to manage. It's, it's huge and it's really difficult for folks to kind of tackle a project like this. So what we're trying to gain from this challenge is to find these smaller infestations so, you know, we can really tackle it um, so it doesn't become a big issue like the photo at the bottom. And in terms of Asian jumping worm, uh, again, we don't have a lot of data in New York State. Um, and, you know, it can really help inform decisions. So uh, folks, again, like prison leaders can uh, figure out uh, where to focus their conservation efforts or where to install uh, uh, boot brush stations at trailheads. So it's all data that we can use. All right, so uh, this is a map of confirmed water chestnut distribution. As you can see, um, it's pretty widespread through, throughout New York State, and it's well documented. But there's a lot of spa uh, places in New York State we don't know if it is present or if it's absent. So, for example, if you see um, Oneida Lake there, uh, Oneida Lake has confirmed water chestnut. Um, but we don't really know where it's coming from. So if you see north of it, we have no reports of water chestnut. Uh, are those, uh, you know, tributaries? Is that kind of the source of water chestnut? Um, so yeah, it, we don't know a lot of data. So this is only the confirmed ones. And, and this is, again, where you guys come in. You can report and, and um, do a simple presence absence survey. So that um, is what Jen Dean will talk about in a bit. Um, but you can tell us whether it's there or it's not. So we have, you know, we can fill that data, um, all the database in with that information. Um, so again, here's the confirmed jumping worm distribution. Um, again, we have not much data at all. Um, so, you know, you see it kind of spread throughout New York State. Um, we don't know a lot of information. Um, if you see, you know, it's in Syracuse and it's Rochester, you know, what about the space in between there? Is it there? Um, again, we have 
uh, this competition to kind of fill in that data gap. Uh, we want folks to go out in their backyards and, and or wherever they're going this summer to look and, and report uh, if it's there or if it's not. So we know where, where it is, where it's going, and uh, really fill in those, those blanks. So how do I participate in the IMAP Invasive uh, Mapping Challenge? Um, so the reporting window is July 5th to the 19th. Um, it's as simple as just looking at your backyard in your local park or your lake. Um, so again, we'll talk about this more in the IMAP portion of the program. Um, so you just simply enter your observations into the IMAP database, and that's pre presence or absence, as simple as that. And again, Jennifer Dean will cover how to uh, do that into the IMAP. And the really exciting part about this is um, we will award prizes for the individual who reports the greatest number of observations. So again, that includes negative observations. So um, you don't have to necessarily find water chestnut or jumping worm. You're just reporting it, um, you, know, you know, what you see. Um, and again, that's just as important data to have as, as it is the presence data. And we'll also reward um, a prize to the PRISM region with the most observation. So you see the photo on the right there. Um, that is our, uh, well, our previous coordinator for the Capital Mohawk PRISM, Oral Gaylor, um, being rewarded the, the coveted water chestnut trophy um, from Meg Wilkinson, who works at IMAP. Um, we had some issues with the, um, the water chestnut uh, trophy. It's been falling apart, so our, um, IMAP intern here, Jess, has agreed to, to redo it, so we're really excited to see the outcome. We'll also have a jumping worm uh, trophy as well. Um, so I believe uh, Western New York was the previous uh, winner, so, um, you know, it, again, it fosters a little competition and excitement, so, uh, yeah, make your prison proud and get out there this summer and report. And just a quick, quick uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, plug here, um, Invasive Species Awareness Week is July 8th through the 14th, so um, this is part of that program, that larger campaign, um, you know, the reporting time frame, the 5th through the 19th is during ISAW, and um, we made it a little bit longer, so it's about two weeks so that you guys can go out there and report. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's just wanted to mention it, um, you know, if you guys participate in this, there's also lots of other great events that are um, happening near, near you, and you can find all that information on www.stoptheinvasionny.com, and you can sort um, through your local prism, so, um, you know, if you're in Western New York, you can uh, look at the specific calendar for Western New York. So you'll uh, pull it up and it will eventually be, when you pull it up, uh, it will be a lot of different statewide, but you can narrow it down to your specific prism and, you know, events happening near you. Okay, so um, I am quickly going to switch over to um, our next presenter. Um, I have Anna Stopson, um, so pardon me while I stop sharing my screen and switch it over to Anna. There we go. Enter. All right, Anna, can you hear me? Uh, uh, now, can you hear me? Yes, you are live. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. so take it away. Thank you very much. All right, so we as a society really have a positive opinion of earthworms. We think of them as creating soil, adding nutrients, and improving soil quality for more water infiltration and less compaction. Um, and in fact, a lot of how we think about earthworms was informed by Darwin. Um, he carefully observed them and published a final book about their behavior. Um, they, were, they were actually considered pests before this, and so he almost single-handedly rehabbed their image. Um, a lot of these things are certainly true in agricultural settings. Um, in agricultural fields, these plants um, and the, uh, the plants that we plant into these systems 
behave really differently than natural ones. Um, if agricultural fields have a nutrient deficiency, we can apply fertilizer. Um, but forest plants rely on complex biological communities, including symbiotic fungi, to acquire nutrients. Um, soils in agricultural fields are going to be compacted by machinery already, so any earthworm activity that um, creates pores is going to improve these conditions. Uh, however, in forests, they have a dust layer that holds moisture and prevents compaction. So we have to think about these two systems really differently. Um, the other thing that Darwin was doing when he was thinking about earthworms is he was observing them in their native range in Europe. Um, we don't know for certain what the historical extent of earthworms in the U.S. would have been um, on geological timescales because they, uh, they decompose really quickly and they don't make great fossils. But our best hypothesis is that um, if we had native earthworms in New York State, that they're pushed back by the last glaciation, kind of seen here in this purple line. Um, and they've been really slow to recolonize after that. So what this means is that our New York State and our New England forests have developed at least since the last glaciation without, uh, without earthworms. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that not all earthworms are created equal. So many of our native earthworms with their range shown here in pink, um, they really grow to a much lower abundance and this includes some of these little circles out here um, that are threatened prairie earthworms. So when you are going out and doing your IMAP challenge, um, almost certainly every single earthworm that you will see will be introduced from Europe or Asia. It can be a little bit tricky to identify them because we've got 16 or more co-occurring co species, so longer standing European um, invasive, invasive earthworms and then the newer um, wave of invasion from jumping worms. So this is just a little schematic of what earthworms do uh, when they move into a system. On the left, we've got, um, we've got sort of an ecosystem that's um, devoid of earthworms. So in the absence of earthworms, northern forests develop a thick organic uh, soil layer right here. And, <clears throat> and this is going to happen when inputs from things like leaves are exceeding the organic matter that's used up or lost in the system. And this organic layer plays a really critical role in protecting the soil from erosion. Um, it's really soft, provides habitat for roots and for fungi, and for there's a whole um, sort of food web that relies on it. Now, when earthworms move into the system, that's the schematic here on the right, um, they're going to eliminate that organic horizon on the top, and they're going to um, speed up decomposition and mix it into lower soil layers. And so um, over time, what you're going to see is this organic layer is gone, and it exposes a lot of plant roots, which causes them to desiccate and die. Um, soil profile itself becomes sort of vertically homogenized without those distinct layers that you see in our um, intact forests, and you can see nutrients getting le leached out of the system. So from some research that I've done and some research out in the Midwest in um, Minnesota, we've identified a number of uh, groups that seem to be benefiting from earthworms and those that seem to uh, lose out when earthworms move into a system. So losers include a lot of our charismatic long-lived perennials, woody seedlings, and um, a lot of species that rely on symbiotic fungi to get their nutrients. Um, the winners, this on the bottom panel here, this is kind of indicative of an earthworm invaded forest. We've got lots of grasses and sedges, um, disturbance adapted native plants, ferns with the exception of some, uh, some ferns that are dependent on mycorrhizal fungi, that's the symbiotic fungi that I was talking about, and other non-native plants. So we have evidence that earthworms can facilitate invasive plants, um, that the removal of invasive plants can decrease earthworm populations. But for a lot of invasive plants, um, this relationship isn't really well resolved, despite the fact that you almost never see one without the other. You almost never see garlic mustard without invasive earthworms. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you specifically about jumping worms, which go by many common names, uh, the Jersey Jersey Wigglers, Alabama Jumpers, Georgia Jumpers, and despite all of their very North American sounding names, um, they're in fact coming over from East Asia. Um, we've got about 
16 species that look very similar in North America, and in New York State, we've got five species. And so whereas European earthworms are still generally beneficial in agricultural systems that I talked about before, um, jumping worms are destructive in all habitats that we've looked at. Um, their impacts have been independently noticed by practitioners on the ground, like managers, botanical garden staff, even a hosta growing club noted this. And it's really interesting because it, um, all of these people persevered in their observations despite the prevailing knowledge that earthworms are good for a system. Um, jumping worms are destructive mainly because um, they cause really big changes in the soil. Um, so they change the conditions and the soil dries out, uh, it erodes really easily and doesn't retain nutrients. And one of the reasons that this is so destructive is that um, these jumping worms can live at really high densities, reaching, easily reaching 100 worms per square meter. And, um, and so these earthworms are spreading northwards. They're displacing the previous European earthworms. So from just an academic standpoint, it's really interesting to think about how one invasion is replacing an older invasion. And they tend to be associated with horticultural fill and mulch beds. So their cocoons get spread around by mulching. Um, and this is a problem because as soils dry out from jumping worms, people sometimes spread more and more mulch to solve the problem, but that is in fact making the problem worse. So we don't know a ton about the distribution. We know they were found in greenhouses and zoos um, around New York in the 1940s, in the wild in New York by the 80s. And now they have a patchy spread in New York State. Um, there's, as of 2017, there's only one observation down here in southern Ontario. Um, but I suspect that as we start looking for them, we might find them um, in some new places. What makes them so invasive? Um, they have a very flexible diet. They uh, they're annuals in New York State, so they reach maturity in just 60 days. So they mature very quickly and produce eggs very quickly. The other interesting thing is that some of the species don't need another individual to mate with. So they can just lay eggs that are essentially copies of themselves. Um, they also do a lot of, uh, they have a lot of habitat flexibility. So this is a picture um, taken from a stream bed, but they can be in, in forests, in farms all over the place. Um, but really, we, um, we don't fully know what makes them so invasive. And that's why um, we're trying to get more information from you guys to help us inform that. So when you are looking to um, identify a jumping worm for IMAPS, the first place to start is by looking at the soil. In an uninvaded forest, you'll see this organic horizon right here with leaves from last year. Um, and below that, more decomposing leaves, you'll see roots. Um, if you have really good eyes, you might even see some little white hair-like um, fungal hyphae. Now, if you look at soils invaded by European earthworms, the soil is going to appear much more mixed. Um, you might see mineral soil like this right under last year's leaves. Jumping worm invasion soil looks really quite distinctly different right here on the right. Um, a jumping room invasion has this very granulated look. Um, it's been described as maybe looking like bent coffee grounds out of a French press. And the soil, the changes in soil are really what I believe are the most destructive about jumping worms. So you can imagine the plant trying to grow here um, in gravel. It's going to desiccate really quickly um, and it's, it's not going to survive very well. All right, and so looking at the soil is really helpful because as I mentioned, jumping worms in New York State, the ones we have here now are annuals. So they're only going to be visible in warmer months and they're going to be more difficult to identify as juveniles in the spring. All right, so you've checked off the box, you've seen granulated soil. The next thing to look for is the jumping worms themselves. And they are what we call epigeic species, which means that they live fairly close to the surface. So on a rainy day, you should be able to see them. <clears throat> now the behavior is really what gets people noticing them. So uh, here on the left, we've got, uh, we've got 
the behavior of jumping worms, the way that they move, they thrash about, they move really quickly, but it's not just the speed of their movement, it's the actual locom locomotion. So this one here, and this is our night crawler, our European species, you'll notice that it moves along um, by contracting and expanding its segments. Now, they're not always gonna be moving this slowly, but the difference in how they move is gonna be really helpful for you to come back and identify uh, jumping ones. All right, so if you want to be more quantitative, um, then you can sample for earthworms. So here I've got a quadrat of a standardized size, so I can actually figure out what the density of earthworms are per meter squared. And to sample them, it's really, really easy. Um, you can get everything you need from the grocery store. So um, what I use here to get earthworms to come up is ground mustard, and you mix it with water, and it irritates the mucous membranes of the earthworms, which causes them to come up to the surface. But the nice thing about this is it doesn't really have any lasting um, effects on the rest of the community. You pour it slowly over the soil, and then uh, based on their behavior, um, you can identify them to the jumping worm family. So for IMAP, that's, that's as far as we need to go. If you're curious and you want to go further and try and identify them to species, which can be pretty challenging, you can fix them in formalin and then preserve them in ethanol. Now, formalin is quite toxic, so if you don't have the, the fume hood and the capability of working with formalin, you can put them in ethanol, but you need to get to them and identify them pretty quickly because they are going to um, get destroyed quickly. Okay, so you've got your earthworm. First thing to look at is the size range. So they're gonna be, the worms will be pretty uniform uh, jumping worms are going to be pretty uniform in the system. So in the spring, they're going to be closer to 2 centimeters, and in the fall, they're going to be closer to 20 centimeters. But most of the ones that you'll be looking at will be uniform in size. Like I said, they're living more or less at the surface, so they're very darkly pigmented. And in the sun, this looks really metallic or iridescent, which can be um, something to look for. Now, um, Lumbricus terrestris, which is one of the European species, also known as Canada nightcrawler, um, it can be one that looks a lot like um, jumping worms. So you want to be able to tell the difference between these two groups. And one easy way is if you go out in the summer or fall and they have, uh, they've matured into adults and they have this female reproductive organ called the clitellum. So on the European species, it's going to um, maintain its segments if you look closely at it, versus the jumping worm where it's just going to be a ring, um, and it's also going to be very close to the head versus the European species that's closer to the middle. Um, or you could use my little trick that I used to remember. The European species is kind of puffed out um, a little bit like an inner tube, whereas the jumping worms, it sort of cinches in their body a little bit like a corset, right? So jumping worms, corset, close to the head. Um, if the worms are not yet mature, you will have to um, look at them with a hand lens or under a dissecting scope. And, and so the European species are going to have setae, which, uh, which are these little appendages here, and they probably won't have more than maybe 10 visible. The jumping worms, on the other hand, have a bristle-like arrangement, so you'll see it along here, along each segment, so there'll be many, many more uh, closely, closely put together here. If you do want to get down to species, it's very difficult. Um, a lot of the individuals look very similar. Um, you can do a genetic analysis. There's also a great new key um, that Chang put out in 2016, but it is very technical, and we don't really need this information for IMAP. This is just for your own curiosity. All right, so the last thing, once you have identified that you have a jumping worm invasion, is to upload your data to IMAP. So as you can see here that Emma pointed out before, um, we really don't have a ton of data about um, jumping worms in New York State. And we really want to get more data so that we can um, make some species distribution maps. So when you're uploading your, your pictures, make sure that you take a lot of pictures. I think you can only upload one, 
But if for some reason we can't confirm the identity based on that one picture, it's good to have multiple. You can dispose of the worms by freezing them or euthanizing them in ethanol. And what I would really encourage you to do is include additional observations as comments. Um, like I said before, we don't know a ton about these earthworms in their um, invasive range. And so any little observation that you have about them could really inform uh, future work. We want to make sure that you take a really good photograph. Um, so ideally, a mature specimen that has a visible cotylum is really, really helpful. Um, make sure you have good resolution. And include an item for scale. A ruler is best. Um, something standardized like a penny um, is OK. But hands, that can be uh, different sizes. So that's not ideal. You can use a contrasting background, um, a little takeout container might be ideal if sort of got lift edges and as you saw earlier they thrash around a lot so this might be a good way to contain them. Um, straighten out your worm as best you can and make sure that you just put in sort of one to three individuals instead of a big clump of 20. They do like to come out in big clumps but um, they're much easier to identify if they uh, if each individual is visible. All right, so quick summary about identifying them. Um, the first thing that you're going to do for IMAP is just visually inspecting the soil, observing that thrashing behavior, and looking for a corset clitellum close to the head end of the body. Um, if, you, if you're feeling a little bit more ambitious, you can look for that bristle-like setae, um, little hairs around the ring of each segment. If you want to go down to species, that's where you'll need a dissecting scope, we need to preserve adult specimens and then follow the guidelines in that key. Um, and so I always get asked the question about management. This is what a lot of you guys, I'm sure, are interested in. And currently, we don't have any effective management of um, jumping worms or earthworms in general. So we're putting all of our focus onto preventing spread. Um, so they have really resilient eggs, little cocoons, that are spread around in mud. So anytime you're moving mud, you're possibly moving jumping worms. Um, in the tread of um, logging equipment or restoration equipment or vehicles, that can be a way that you move them around. But even, you know, in the treads, if you've got some thick treads on your muddy hiking boots. So ensuring that you've got things like boot cleaning stations, um, when you're either leaving a jumping worm area or um, entering a jumping worm free area could be helpful. And if you're doing any uh, management activity or logging or landscaping, put in a clause with your contractor um, about having clean equipment. Um, a lot of people are also asking about community plant sales, especially native plant sales. And I would encourage you to encourage um, the people in your areas to to postpone those, and you can work, you can work with us on um, developing a jumping worm-free certification process. That's good, get people engaged, but also make sure that you aren't spreading these. Uh, be really careful when you're mulching and composting from unknown sources. And um, though jumping worms are illegal to sell in New York State currently, it can be. Uh, difficult to control that. So make sure that any bait sales um, don't contain jumping worms. All right, so that is what I had for you guys. Um, so I'm not I, exactly sure. Questions. <laughs> I was just going <laughs> to ask, yeah, open it up for questions. I know you have to leave. Um, so if folks want to either um, write it in the chat box or um, which I will put back. Oh, let's see. Oh, I think it's very here. Hopefully folks can do the chat function um, so you can chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, just make sure that um, the question is going out to everyone, not just to um, me. Um, so any questions? Okay, we have one from Connie. Um, how do we post European worm? Uh, do you want photos, et cetera? Um, I guess, is that in regards to IMAP and putting those into IMAP? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, so I'm going to actually maybe leave that one to you because we were kind of having this discussion about whether or not to include European species um, in IMAP. Do you want Great. to answer that again? Oh, sure. We do have um, two lumber uh, species that are on the species list uh, for IMAP basis now. And in addition to that, we have the Amenthus jumping worm. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next session about IMS spaces. But, you know, just ensuring you take a good photo because um, I know and these, the, some of the other experts will probably be squinting at some of the photos that come in to, to see um, if that's showing the signs that can distinguish between the Europeans and European and the Asian birds. Uh, we also have another question in the room from uh, Steve Young here, um, our botanist from New York State. Uh, where um, do you start looking for them? Mm. <laughs> so um, let's see, is this, is this like for the IMAP challenge or is this just when you're looking? For IMAP challenge. For IMAP challenge, okay. Um, so I would, Say that sit, like they're very visible right under the leaf litter. Um, so um, I would say find a forest patch, maybe near, they tend to be closer to roads and trails. Um, they also tend to be close to botanical gardens and horticultural areas, so you could start there. Um, and just sort of remove the leaf litter just a little bit, look under, you could even do it with your boots if you're a little bit squeamish. Um, just brush off that top layer of soil, and they should um, come out. Is that is that the, the question you were asking? Yeah. Yep. Um, can I chime in for a sec? Because I know that uh, Anise and I, we were talking about this a couple weeks ago. Um, we were thinking of encouraging people to look, you know, in a natural area like she just described, and also, you know, feel free to look in your backyard. So if you are a gardener and you have earthworms, this is your chance now that you have this knowledge that she just gave us to um, try to distinguish between the species. So, you know, try to get a natural area and your backyard if you want to as well. Okay, great. Uh, I think we also have a question from Cornell Cooperative Extension out of Broome County. Um, they want to know where do you find information on the certification process? So this, this was just something that I was racking my head over the other day because I'd gotten so many questions from um, from people about whether or not they should postpone their plant sales. And it was just breaking my heart to tell them to stop doing it. So <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking that, um, you know, it, it is, once you know what you're looking for, it is relatively easy to be sure that you, to, to know whether or not you have jumping worms. So by getting this information out, um, that is going to be helpful. So I don't know at what level you want to have this. I guess maybe at the level that the sale is happening. But I am I'm like really committed if somebody wants to start developing this with me to come up with like a checklist. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't exist currently. Um, I was just thinking that that might be a way to be able to have people feel good about having plant sales again. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from John Thompson. Um, this is more a question for you, Jen, and the IMAP team. Is it possible to upload videos to IMAP to show them wiggling? Uh, we would love to have the, your videos, but um, you cannot technically enter it into IMAP because it has to be a JPEG. Um, that has to be a photo file. But you can always email it to us because, you know, we need entertainment throughout the day and <laughs> better than videos of worms. <laughs> so please, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Actually, <laughs> you know, that's a fantastic idea. So maybe if you upload your picture and if, um, if we come back and we tell you that we can't say for sure, then have that video on hand to send because that, you know, even when they are not mature, having the video is really um, a really good way to be sure. Great. Um, let's see, I have some other questions here. Um, so from Chris Mars, um, have jumping worms ever been found in riparian areas? I was helping plant trees in Westchester County along a stream and we found some worms that we're not sure if they were jumping worms or not. Yeah, 
So uh, I have a couple of comments about that. This picture here that I used a couple of times was taken by Audrey Bo, who is on the call, I believe, um, and it is from a stream bed. So they are definitely in riparian areas. They are definitely um, uh, in very moist areas. And this is also a way we believe that their cocoons are spread. So they they can survive just fine underwater. Their cocoons can survive underwater. So this is this is a way that they get um, spread around. So you do, I would say that you do tend to find them almost more often in riparian areas than elsewhere. Um, having said that, you may have noticed that I was using kind of careful language when I said that all worms in New York State are invasive. There was, in fact, just a recent paper that found that, in fact, there's one native um, worm in New York State, and that's found specifically in riparian areas. So it is a good idea to uh, make sure that you get those identified from specifically that area um, to make sure that you're not removing the very rare native ones. Great. So we also have another question from Joyce. Um, she said, regarding plant cells, are the cocoons visible in spring on the roots of perennials? Um, okay, so here I've got kind of a picture of them. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, so they're about the same size as the granules of uh, that the earthworms make this little. So they're the, about the size of like a large coffee ground. Um, so I would say that it's pretty hard to see them. This one's yellow, but they can get sort of muddy. And if this got muddy, it would be very hard to tell it apart from, you know, another ground. Um, having said that, one thing that we did when we were planting things is um, we triple rinsed the roots. Um, so we, we took roots that were growing in soil and then we rinsed them three times and sort of visually inspected the roots once there was no more soil on them. And then we felt pretty confident um, that we were not spreading jumping worms. So if you, can, if you can do that, if you can just look at them on the roots themselves, then you should be able to see them. But if it's roots plus soil, I would say it's pretty unlikely. Okay, uh, looks like we have uh, more of a comment uh, from Bob Stromberg. Uh, he said he's had some great success alerting people of hemlock woolly adelgid uh, invasions in Saratoga County by carrying around flyers, <laughs> one laminate that he shows, uh, but he keeps it, and others that are two-sided color sheets, one printed at Staples to give away. And uh, he's given away quite a lot. Um, and. Uh, He's also had great success posting to Facebook groups. Uh, with hemlocks, you can get homeowners interested. It's obvious that they don't want to lose their trees. Um, so yeah, that's great advice for outreach. You know, if, if folks are out in the field, um, I definitely encourage you to bring some information. Um, I know that Cornell's Cooperative Extension, I can't remember which county has a great fact sheet available. Um, you can find online. So if you're getting inquiries, uh, please distribute them, bring them to local organizations who might be interested and, you know, consider, you know, spreading the word and, and, and really getting that message out there. Yeah, I, thanks a lot, Bob. That's actually really helpful. And I think that um, for jumping worms in particular, they move, their movement, if anyone's seen them, they move so weirdly. And there's a lot of fascination out there from people making this observation. Um, I've heard tons of people just running little mini experiments with them, uh, feeding them to their chickens to see if they'll eat them, things like that. So, um, yeah, I think that is a very fruitful, fruitful ground for um, getting that information out. Great. Oh, and it looks like um, John uh, Piston shares the Onondaga CCE fact sheet. Um, and it looks like Brittany Rogers um, conveniently shared it with um, the group. So uh, CCE Tompkins County has it right there. Um, so I think everyone can see that link and click it. And yeah, please distribute. Um, and yes, we can definitely, I got a question from Slilo Prism, um, we can definitely make this presentation available to folks. Um, maybe we can put it on the IMAP website in a PDF form for folks to, to share. Um, we also, I'm sorry? Oh, no, I just said sure, that sounds good. 
Awesome. And then um, we also have a question um, from Anne. Uh, she asked, can you show the slide comparing the night crawler with jumping worms again? Sure. Uh, this the behavioral one or the, um, I have a couple of those slides. Is this the one you're talking about? Um, Anne, can you clarify which slide? Is this the one you're looking for? Both would be good, she said. <laughs> okay, so this is one. Um, this is their behavior. And then the other one is this one right here. Here. So this is actually a different worm, but this is our, uh, this is a lumber kiss right here. And then this is the jumping worm. <clears throat> so uh, clitellum, visible close to the head, and uh, this is the corset one. Versus, this is the inner tube one. Okay. We also have another question from Steve. Um, should we ask our local nurseries if they are uh, certified free? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to clarify one more time that there there is not actually an existing certification process. This is um, something that I just sort of dreamed up in the last <laughs> couple of weeks. Um, um, but I think that it would be a really important thing to move towards because that is just such an easy place uh, for jumping rooms to get established and then to be distributed out really, really widely. Um, and since it's a nursery, actually working with plants in pots, like in the, in the potting mix and crow mix, it's relatively easy. If you look out in August and you look through the soil, you will know if you've got jumping worms. Great. I think we'll just take maybe one or two more questions. I have one from Linda Rolier, um from Lower Hudson Prism. Um, asking, uh, when do you expect they'll be maturing and if they have the clitellum <laughs> uh, now or later in the summer? Clitellum, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I've got a little timeline here. Um, it does kind of depend on the year. And so last year we had a really, really wet year and they, they grew very quickly and they were very visible. And so I think last year is the year that a lot of people started noticing them. Um, so they are going to come out, they're going to hatch um, once the temperature is above 10 degrees Celsius. So that's, you know, sometime in April. They're probably going to start um, maturing in sort of mid, early July, depending on the year. Um, as long as it's been, I guess the minimum would be 60 days from the um, from the first day that it was above 10 degrees Celsius. So that's the absolute minimum, and so I wouldn't go out before then. I don't know when that day was, but you could certainly calculate that easily enough. And they are going to, so if you're looking, August and September is a really good time. A rainy day in August and September, you'll know if they're there. Um, by mid-October, they usually disappear. And if you have any other days below 5 degrees Celsius, they will also disappear earlier. Um, we do have a great question here um, from Joyce. Um, she wants to know if that's soil temperature or the air temperature. Um, that, oh, that's a good question. I, I'm taking this from a study that I can't fully remember the details of. So this was done in lab conditions. I believe that it was the um, that it was the air temperature, but like I said, this is not actually from uh, wild earthworms or earthworms living in the wild. So it's certainly possible that there would be some um, deviation from these temperatures. Uh, but I would say that air temperature is probably one you could go from. Great. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question, if anyone out there wants to type something in. Um, so it looks like CCE Broome County um, is asking, us, are these soil temps? And I think you just answered that question. Um, any other folks on the line before Andrea heads out? And uh, excuse me, <laughs> um, do you mind providing your email address in case maybe folks have questions? If they oh yeah, absolutely. I will put it in the chat right now. 
All right, great. And yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. And um, yeah. we really appreciate you having here. Um, some great questions. And uh, yeah, so there's her email address right there. Um, you know, for folks, if you have further questions or, you know, feel free to contact myself or um, Jennifer Dean here. But yeah, jumping from questions, definitely, I would suggest talking to Dr. Dobson. So um, thank you guys. And yeah, we're going to uh, move on to our IMAP portion of the program. Um, so let's move on. Thank you again, um, Honest. And uh, let's, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, just not uh, stop sharing your screen there. Thank you. All right, so we're moving on to Jennifer Dean here. Um, give, give me a second here to share screens. Oh, there you are. And roll to presenter. Great. All right, uh, let's see here. Can folks, no, you can't see my screen. Okay. <laughs> Big button there. Sure. Okay. Just a moment. Big button. All right. There we go. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, that was a great uh, background about the jumping worms, and I know I learned a lot from that. And. I'm going to go out and look in my garden when I get home <laughs> and see, see if those worms that I've been feeding to the chickens are the European or the, um, the Asian jumping worms. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to enter the information. So when you go out for your, your challenge and you're, you have your friendly competition against your neighbors um, on who can look the most for these species. So we're not just focusing on you know, whether or not you, or whether you found it, you know, just as many finds, but also your search efforts. So even if you don't find it, which is kind of what we hope, right, um, you will get credited for your, um, your looking. All right, so hopefully a lot of folks have um, downloaded the app already, the mobile app. We're going to talk about that right at the end. But first, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background in case you're not familiar with IMAP Invasive, which is managed by the New York National Heritage Program. And the Heritage Program is um, tasked by the state for managing information about biodiversity in New York State. And one of the, the um, programs that we have within the National Heritage Program is the Invasive Species Database. So we manage the information for New York on where invasive species are from other entities, whether they're agencies or nonprofit organizations or local citizens who are concerned about invasive species. And we use it, we use this system statewide for a number of things. First of all, reporting new findings. So when you, you're out and about and you find invasive species, um, all taxonomic groups, um, aquatic or terrestrial, you can report them to the database. Um, this aggregation of information gives us a really good picture of the distribution of species across the state. Of course, there will always be some data gaps, and so that's why we need an army of eyes on the ground, so people like you who are learning how to report information, and so you can help fill in some of those data gaps. There, we won't get into this today, but there is a way to manage and track um, control efforts. So if you're going out and doing treatments to an area for invasive species, you can document the details of those treatments um, within the database and show the, the spatial extent. And another key uh, reason that we use a, a state system is to get information out to people who need to know about it. So we have early detection alerts that are set up. Um, the prism leaders each receive alerts of what's been entered in their, their prism from the day before. And we have a, a team of state uh, experts like from DEC and Ag and Markets and so forth that are set up for early detection alerts on certain species groups. All right, so how can IMAP invasives help you? <laughs> At the local level, you know, we're, uh, it provides a platform, like I said, for entering invasive species information. Um, you can also get into the system and view what's near you and also what's approaching your region. So you can look at the map and um, do queries and reports within the system, which I'll show a, a tiny bit of at the end. 
Um, you can also record your management and treatment efforts. And it's really a great communication tool for organizations, um, especially as you're monitoring change over time. So if you're managing infestations, you know, hopefully those efforts are paying off and, you know, your infestations are decreasing, um, you can have that information um, be displayed year after year. And then from a more uh, state level or prison-wide level, um, as I mentioned, IMAP sends out emails to the prison leaders and to a lot of state experts to make sure that the communication is, um, you know, delivered and so that uh, our the folks that need to know about it are aware of it, and they can also help assist with the confirmation process. And um, a lot of our, our um, state partners refer to the IMAP data when they're trying to prioritize their summer crew work. So it's important to know uh, where invasive species are and how widespread they are. So our objective today for this part is to learn how to log in to IMAP Invasives and do a few things like search the map and view data and the table and a query, um, but also how to enter data through the IMAP Invasives mobile app. So this would be from your smartphone. So you can get to our database through nyimapinvasives.org. Uh, this will bring you to our, our launch screen, which Actually, just a side note, in the next day or two, this will transform into a beautiful new website um, that, our, that Colleen from our program and Jessica, our intern, have been working very hard on. So the, the visual will change, but the, the content will be there, and you'll have a big Login Now button. Um, and so the information that we do have coming into the database comes from a number of different sources. Um, we have um, uploads of existing data from our partner organizations, so these are state agencies and so forth, um, our natural resource groups, so it could be, say, the Nature Conservancy or Lake um, Association, lots of different groups who are collecting data already. Um, researchers, there's a lot of museum data that we've been aggregating to get that historical context. But data is also coming from people like you who are learning how to enter the information either through the mobile app or directly online. And so when you go to that Login Now button, that will take you to a login screen. Um, I did put beneath it the direct URL for the actual launch or login page for the database. Um, because we are in this transition of moving our website to a brand new one, um, if you push that button tomorrow, it or it may or may not take you to the exact address, so you might want to just jot down that login.imathinvasive.org backslash N-Y-I-M-I backslash login. Sorry, I know it's a long, messy URL, but this, uh, just because we're doing this transition tomorrow um, in case you can't find the login button. But you could always email us if you think something's a mess, and uh, we'll, we'll send you to the right spot. So once you log in, you'll see a number of different options. So these boxes that you're seeing are ways to either enter the data or to view the, the data in various ways, like either the map or table. Um, there, you can also set up email alerts. There's a little button there. Um, there's also ways to get in there and change your password, um, you know, set your organization and make sure your email address is correct and things like that. Um, and of course, I think, the, the fun, really fun part about this is viewing the map and looking at where observations have been found. And so one of the first things that I think people will do when they get in here is want to look for a particular species. So there's a search box up at the top of the, the map that you can put in your species name, and then there's a little magnifying glass next to that search box. You just want to make sure you hit that so it tell, it'll tell you that it's loading now to load the data. And it'll, it can take a few seconds to, to load it up. There's a lot of spatial information going back and forth. Um, but here you can see the information for jumping worm. I, the green dots are what you saw in the previous maps that Anise and uh, Emma showed, and those are the confirmed records. So they've been confirmed by an expert. Um, Andrea Davalos um, from SUNY Cortland has um, looked at a lot of these as well. Um, and those yellow ones are the unconfirmed um, jumping worm observations. And so I left those in there uh, just 
I want you to see those, they've all been reviewed, but we just can't tell from the photograph or perhaps there is no photograph. Um, so we don't, you know, we have no way to completely verify 100% that yes, that is jumping worm. But we leave that information there in case maybe somebody wants to go out and check it and, and get another photograph. You can also produce different maps like county level distribution um, under the, there's a summary data tab on the left hand side um, that gives you an opportunity to select your species and choose either county or watershed so you can get different ways of displaying that information. And then here's the, the watershed distribution map for water chestnut. And so you can see that there are a number of watersheds that do have water chestnut in them. Um, and here are the, the point representations of that. Um, but there, there are many, many water bodies that do not yet have water chestnut. So even if it, you see these clusters of observations, it doesn't mean that every water body in that area is um, infested with water chestnut. And it's usually quite the opposite. Usually there's, um, you know, when somebody finds uh, water chestnut, there might be a lot of observations made in that one water body. Um, so, and that's one thing I should note, that these are number of observations. So it's not those numbers that you see there are not necessarily the number of infestations. It's the number of times that somebody um, could have gone and marked that it was there. So somebody could go back to the same spot the next day and make a second observation. So sometimes those numbers are quite high especially if it's in a water body that a lot of people visit. And then we also have a way for a few select species in the database to record your search effort um, even when you did not find the species you were looking for. So here's the map of water chestnut plus what we call the X water chestnut not detected. So yes, when you enter this, this, type of, this type of data into the database, you will go to X in the alphabetical list of species and where you can find it. And so those blue triangles that are showing up are actually showing you areas where somebody has searched for water chestnut and did not find it. And so this is extremely valuable information. Um, you can see um, where that yellow circle popped up the, on the table of contents, the, um, the different data types there. So we have the, the, the blue triangles for the not detected and then the the green and the yellow circles for the positive hits, either confirmed or unconfirmed. And this not detected information is extremely valuable because it can help clarify whether these, these um, spots in the map where we don't see any water chestnut are either, you know, absence of data because maybe nobody has looked there, there yet, or is it truly the absence of that species? And so this is great information to know going forward. All right, and so if I go back to our dashboard um, within IMAP Invasives, another great tool here is the, the query and reports. And this is a way that you can really filter down the information in the database. Currently, we have about 200,000 observations for almost 400 species of plants and animals. So it's, it can be a lot of information to kind of weave through. And so the query can help by um, walking you through different filters, essentially. So you can do, say, a geography filter. Say you just wanted to know the list of species for your county. Um, you can select county as your geography type, and then it will bring up a list of all the counties. And, and then you can either view that in the table or in a summary report, which is how you get a simple species list, or you can view it on the map. And then there's also other filters that you can apply by species type. You can do multiple species. So you can overlay that X not detected with the positive hits of water chestnut um, on the map. All right. And so at this point, I wanted to let you know uh, a little bit about the IMAP Invasive mobile app. And so this is a way to get information onto the map, like you saw. Everything that you enter will go in as an unconfirmed point until somebody has been able to confirm it um, by looking at the photograph. And so um, the app itself is useful without connectivity. You don't have to have any, you know, like LTE coverage, data coverage when you're out in the field. Um, you can be in the middle of the Adirondacks and this, the app will work just fine as long as you already have it downloaded. 
and it can work on your smartphone, um, which is what I think most people are using it on, but it can also work on a tablet as long as that tablet has a GPS in it. All right, and before I jump um, completely into the app, I, I do want to assure people that even if you don't have a smartphone, don't, or a smartphone even that, you know, can, maybe you're out of space and you can't install another app, <laughs> then don't worry, you can still enter all your information online into the computer. You know, you can collect your information the old-fashioned way with pen and paper um, on field forms or paper forms, and then when you get back inside to your computer, you can enter all the information that, that you could enter with the, the mobile app um, directly into the computer. But I'm going to focus on the right-hand side and, and walk you through setting up the mobile app. And so hopefully everyone has it downloaded already, because um, I'm going to breeze through this. I'm not going um, to spend a whole lot of time to let you download it, <laughs> but if you already have it downloaded, the next steps will go pretty easily. Um, but if you have not downloaded it yet, so you'll open up your app store and search for IMAP Invasive. Um, if you want a direct link from your browser, you can go to our website, but I think the easiest thing is to either go to the App Store for an Apple device or the Google Play Store for a Google device. And just a, a little note, and we'll, I'll talk more about this um, at the very end, but if you get stuck at any point during this process as I walk you through the app setup, don't panic. Um, we're going to have people um, standing by and monitoring the IMAP Invasive email box. That's imapinvasive at dec.ny.gov. And if you get stuck, you can shoot us an email with your phone number, and then at the end of the webinar, uh, somebody will give you a call and help walk you through the rest of the setup for your app. Great. And so now that we're in the app, or if you you're waiting to install it later, you can just kind of watch the, the slides and get a feel for it. The first thing that it's going to prompt you to do is to fill in your preferences, because we need to know who is, um, who's entering the information that's going into this app. And so when you open it up, there will be a menu bar in that top left-hand corner. It's like three little dashes. Um, this will open up your preferences, and you need to select your state, fill in your first and your last name, and then you're going to need to fill in your, your IMAP Invasive username and password. And so we have created your IMAP Invasive username for you. Um, it's not something, unfortunately, that you can create. You, have to, you just have to deal with whatever we come up for you. Um, and if you have pre-registered for this webinar, say, um, as of yesterday or the day before, um, Colleen and Jessica actually created accounts for everyone who had pre-registered. And we have a, a pretty simple little pattern that we use, the first three letters of your first name and your full last name, all lowercase and all one word. So if you're John Smith, your username is now J-O-H Smith. And if this is a new account for you, so you never have had IMAP Invasives before, your password is going to be change me 2018, minus the quotes, some of the quotes in there. Um, and that's all lowercase, all one word as well. If you've already had an IMAP Invasive password, I don't know what it is, I'm sorry. Um, but you can, if you go to the browser and go to our website, you can reset your password and then log it into the app. Oh, and don't panic if you didn't pre-register for today and you don't have an account yet. Um, you can still play along as we try to enter an observation, um, but you won't be able to upload it yet until you get an account. Um, and you can request an account at nyimapinvasives.org. So if you go to our website, um, there's a little, button, a little tab at the top that says request a login on one of the tabs, and um, fill in the Google form that pops up, and we'll get an account back to you. So I have a question here yeah. um, from Connie. Um, she wants to know if you have to belong to an organization to get an account. Nope. You can be just yourself, and uh, <laughs> um, so you can. I think I think there might be an option for no organization, or you can just leave it blank. Or volunteer. Or volunteer. volunteer. Yeah. yeah. However you want to do that. Yeah, we encourage encourage you to to request an account, um, even without an organization. All right, great. So once you filled out those key parts of the preferences, there's still some other preferences that are more optional down below, but are really fun and can help it make it, make it a, um, a smoother workflow for when you're in the field. 
you can customize your species list. Um, there's a couple ways to do that, um, or well, once you, if you push that customize species list button, then you have the option to um, uh, check your species off. And um, I would recommend that people select fake species for testing um, because we're going to use that here in just a moment. Um, you could put um, the presence option for water chestnut and jumping worms if you'd like. And then you could also go to the X in your species list and put X not detected for water chestnut and um, jumping worms if you'd like to. But um, in the essence of time, we'll just keep moving along. Um, there is a jumping worms project that you can sign up for. At, I'm sorry, that we can add you to as long as we know that you took this training today. Um, if you're on our list, we'll add you to the jumping worms project and you can set that as your default if you would like to. Um, and then you just need to make sure that you save. Or you can, you can also leave that default project blank if you'd like. Um, if you're, oh, just a quick reminder for folks, if your app was installed a while ago, um, you could hit that update state data button. Don't hit it if you're new to, if you just installed the app, but this is just for people who have had it for a while. This will grab any new species like that X not detected one. All right. So we're, once you save it, it'll take you back to the screen. We're going to add an observation, and you should really do it. So <laughs> go ahead and take a photo if you'd like. Um, this is the best way to test if your phone is going to work with the app. Every once in a while we get some phones that will give you an error message. Um, select the fake species. We don't want any red alerts going out to, to folks accidentally. And then you should be able to see the map with your location. Um, if you don't have connectivity, then the map won't show, and that's okay. Um, as long as your GPS is working, it should be fine. Um, you know if your GPS is working because you will see coordinates underneath the map. If you see a zero, zero, it means that your GPS is not enabled on your phone, so you need to um, turn on your location services. And this is something we can help, help you with in Tech Hour afterwards. Um, and then there's a common field as well. We would love it if you um, put some information about the, your search effort, so the time spent surveying or size of area searched, and um, the size of the infestation if you did find one of your, your um, invasive species. And then so go ahead and save that. Let's see. And so, oh, just a little more information about that common field. Um, for jumping worms, we're recommending that you spend at least five minutes in an area before you put an X not detected. So, you know, just start your stopwatch um, or your phone alarm, um, and then the size of the area is searched and whether or not you found other earthworms. Um, water chestnut, similar, time spent searching, um, and then the size of the area that you searched or, say, maybe just the south shoreline of a certain water body. And then if you did find something, um, how much of it that you found. All right, make sure your photos are great. Um, you know, think about the jumping worm photos. And then we need to upload. So you can go ahead and upload this card that's here on your, your front screen for your fake species. You go back to that little menu bar, and you need to select your, your species. Make sure that little checkbox on your, your yellow card is selected. And then upload it. And it'll ask, are you sure you want to upload? And then once you upload it, it goes up to the mothership, and it's in the database. <laughs> and voila, the, uh, the yellow card has disappeared from your screen. So if you see the yellow card still, that means it has not been uploaded. So just keep that in mind. All right. And so once you've uploaded it, you can check it online. On the, um, you can log in with that same username and password into IMAP Invasives and view the table. Um, that will. It's sorted by the most recent first, and um, you should you can put your name into the search box and bring up your your observations. And then every once in a while, about every week, we delete all those fake um, species. So we'll we'll do that probably at the end of this week. <laughs> all right. And just a quick um, shot of the the um, table and what your record would look like. So when you open your individual record, it's actually editable and you can upload new photos at that point. So even though with the app you can only take one at a time, you can upload it there, upload additional ones there. And so go ahead and begin your searching. 
And I know we're pretty much out of time and there's still a section about water chestnut to, to be had. So should we hold off on questions, Emma? Um, yeah, I can. Okay. I don't have too much to do um, for water chestnut. Okay. So you guys just keep hold on to those questions so we can get the information out there and then at the end we have plenty of time to go through and, and answer more. Okay, and remember if you have any um, issues that you ran into or if you have specific questions, just go ahead and email our IMAP Invasive box now. And um, if you do have a, a specific question about setting up the app, include your phone number and we'll call you back. All right, so with that I will stop sharing I think. Okay. I don't have to share. Okay. Oh, no, that's a little far. <laughs> don't want to go all the way back to the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Pardon me. I think I need to do this here. There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Emma Angelis again from um, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. You heard my voice at the beginning, so I'm rounding it out at the end here um, just to talk about uh, water chestnut. Um, this is a pretty common invasive that you'll see through a lot of bodies of water throughout New York State, so it's a pretty simple one to ID, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, this is our third year for the water chestnut challenge part, um, and again, we just ad uh, added the jumping worm portion this year, so we have a, both an aquatic and a, a terrestrial component. So um, it's really exciting to see what we what the results are for for the mapping challenge. So again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, but yeah, so European water chestnut um, is in a floating aquatic plant. Um, it's an annual. And from Eurasia, um, you wouldn't have guessed it from that name. Um, so Eurasia, um, it was actually introduced in the mid-1800s as an ornamental plant. Um, and the first find was actually near us in Albany here in Schenectady County in Collins Park. Um, so I find that really interesting. Um, can pinpoint it to the, the one uh, first infestation. Um, so what it does, it actually colonizes freshwater lakes and ponds, as well as slow-moving streams and rivers and canals. Um, so we're just going to talk quickly about what um, impacts a water chestnut has on our uh, water body. So it creates these really dense mats that shade out our native plant species. Um, and unfortunately, once the plant itself decomposes, it reduces dissolved oxygen levels, um, which is not so great for fish and may result in their death. Um, unfortunately, it also creates this really dense mat, which makes vegetate, uh, excuse me, recreation really difficult. So it's really hard to paddle, or you know, you'll get your boat stuck in um, you know these really dense tangled mats. Um, swimming is difficult. It's just not a good time. Not the ideal place where you want to recreate. And unfortunately, um, we'll talk about the fruits in a little bit, but um, they're very painful when stepped on. So they're kind of a, a hazard. Um, and again, unfortunately, um, they reduce property values along uh, shorelines. Um, they're not the most pleasant thing to look at. Um, and yeah, so we'll get into now um, the identification portion. So when looking at water chestnut, we're going to first focus on the upper leaves. So they are diamond shaped with toothed edges. Um, you can see it here. I don't know if you of diamond shape there, and you see those little toots. Um, they're actually shiny on the upper side, and they're uh, on the uh, underside, and they're dull with fine fine hairs. Um, so they're alternatively arranged, and they they have these hollow air-filled stems, and they'll occur in floating clusters or rosettes. So you see a classic example here of how they would be arranged on top of the water. Now we'll talk about, um, oh, here's some more photos here of the plant. So you'll see kind of these hollow, um, kind of bulbous, floating, you know, uh, air-filled stems there. So the submerged portion of the plant, um, the, the leaves uh, are opposite, and they're long and narrow, um, and they have these kind of feathery structures um, that often replace the linearly, 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 sorry, linear underwater <laughs> leaves. Um, excuse me. 
Um, so it's a good reference there with the, the, um, the spoon so you kind of know the size that you're dealing with. Um, it almost kind of looks like uh, milk oil underneath, so that's, um, if you're familiar with other invasives. So the flower, which is about in bloom, I think now in June, um, you have four petals, um, white, kind of pretty little flowers. And like I mentioned before, these are the, the fruits here. They're kind of hard nuts. Um, they have these really long spikes, about four inch spines with barbs, and they can actually remain viable for about 12 years, which is one of the struggles of dealing with water chestnut is that you have this huge seed bank um, that, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to manage. Um, and size-wise, the submerged stem can be about 12 to 15 feet long, so they can be they can really quite big. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to mention this part, um, which is so important for you folks out there, you know, out uh, recreating, is just to make sure you're not transporting um, water chestnut and by cleaning, draining, and drying your watercraft. Um, as well as your equipment um, before and after each use, especially um, I know in our local area here, Mohawk, Hudson, um, you know, we have tons of water chestnut. And if you're going up north or any other bodies of water that are uninvaded, it's, you know, it's super crucial that you're inspecting your boat top to bottom. And this even includes your trailer. So often, um, I work for Paul Smith College and we often got, uh, you know, in the watershed steward program, uh, we got calls uh, for a lot of people have found those nutlets in the, the carpet on the trailer. So places you might not even think to look, they can get stuck. So definitely do a thorough inspection of your all your watercraft. And also just making sure you dump your bait bucket um, water where it came from on, uh, or on, la on land. So disposing of it properly just in case you're transporting any sort of um, portion of the plant. Um, Control-wise, um, like we mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, when they're small uh, infestations, they are easily manageable. Um, but unfortunately, once you get to large populations, it's, it's oh, <laughs> I just encourage folks to mute your line. <laughs> um, oh boy. <laughs> Again, uh, folks can just mute their line or, or on, on the phone or, or your, through your computer. That would be very much appreciated. Um, so yes, um, if populations are small, hand pulling it is easy um, when the rosettes first appear. So that's right about now, um, mid-June to early July. Um, but unfortunately, once it gets beyond that point, it's very difficult to manage. Um, so you've seen those pictures of just that heavy, dense um, population. Um, harvesting machines or herbicides can be used, but um, it's a very challenging task. Um, biocontrol is in development, um, so that's pretty exciting. But yes, they are, um, you know, it's important to um, catch these water chestnut infestations when they're small and manageable, because again, once once they reach that certain size, uh, it's just a very challenging task. And a lot of money and time and effort will have to go into it. So we definitely want to try and avoid that if we can. Um, so yeah, that was quick uh, talk on water chestnut. So what we are going to do now is um, <laughs> open it up to more questions. So if you have questions regarding IMAP invasives or water chestnut, please um, feel free to, um, let's see, I have a question here. <laughs> uh, please share um, through chat box or um, let's see, or audio is preferable if you do it through the chat box, it's a lot easier to answer. So I open the line to everyone. I have one question here regarding um, water chestnuts. So are the nutlets slash sheet pods floating in water considered an IMAP observation? Or is just the plant considered an observation? That's a great question. Um, I will turn that over to the IMAP folks. Um, I would say go ahead and take a picture of that nutlet and make an observation. And I mean, chances are it's in a water body that we've already had the um, water chestnut submit it for, um, but if we haven't had it submit it before, then that would be a huge clue that we should go out and look for the, the rosettes. So yes, please go ahead and make your observation and include the photograph, and you can put in the comments field that you did not see any of the, the actual vegetation, but you just saw the seed pod. 
Great question. I also have a question um, from Elisa. Um, I've seen volunteer events for water chestnut pulling. Are there no efforts state slash countywide to remove these invasions? Um, I know there are quite a few um, efforts going on. Um, I know, for instance, uh, the parks um, staff uh, is going out this summer and doing a lot of these removals, as well as the PRISM staff. Um, so if you're looking for an event near you, I definitely suggest contacting your local PRISM and they can hook you up with um, one of those polls. Uh, they could be a lot of fun, I've heard. So um, <laughs> They are, especially yeah. on a hot day. <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely there's a lot of good work going on, but again, it, you know, Usually those folks in the prisms try to, you know, attack those populations that are a little bit smaller. So, um, yeah, I definitely suggest talking to your local prism coordinator. Any other questions regarding water chestnut or IMAP? Again, we have our uh, support team here willing to answer any questions regarding the, um, regarding the app. Um, Okay, let's see, I have a question from Bob. Uh, while looking for hemlock woolly adelgid, I've had problems in the field. If I walk away from the inspection site before saving my observation, the app will try to readjust the location. Oh, that's a good question. So I would recommend that you save your observation and, and exit from the editing mode of the observation before you walk away. Um, actually, we happen to have our app app uh, tech support here, so I don't know, John, do you have um, any ideas about how to prevent the, the um, location from changing as you walk around besides just closing out that, that you observation? You can toggle the um, GPS uh, location update while you're recording an observation, and so if you uncheck the GPS location check box, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact uh, phrase, uh, but that will stop uh, updating your location oh. in the observation. Great, thanks. However, I will make a quick note. Uh, one issue that we are aware of is that sometimes if you edit an observation after you've already saved it, um, at times we have noticed that sometimes the location will try to update to your current location instead of where it was saved. Um, and so that might just be something to be aware of, and we are working to correct that. You could always upload your observation and then edit it online. Maybe that's the safest way. If you want to make sure that your location's in the right spot, that you want to change like your comments field or something like that, you could go ahead and upload it to IMAP and then log in on your browser to do the full editing. Great. And uh, Brittany Rogers made a comment that there is a new update coming that will fix that soon. It is in progress. It's okay. in progress. <laughs> Um, we also have a question from Danica saying, um, will this presentation be available after the webinar? Yes, uh, Danica, it will be available on the nyimapinvasives.org, um, the recorded presentation, and possibly maybe we can put the um, individual presentations as well in PDF format for if you want to share. Yeah, certainly. Do we have any other questions before we close out for the day? Great. Um, our IMAP team is here. I think they'll, they'll be checking the, the email box if you have any questions regarding that. Um, and if you do have remaining questions about jumping worm or water chestnut, um, feel free to contact me. Um, I'd be happy to help. Um, and again, this presentation will be available online. Um, feel free to share for any folks that you may have missed it. Um, and I think maybe we can send an email update um, to those who registered online, you know, connecting um, them with that right. link. And if you didn't register online, please uh, go ahead and request an IMAP account if you haven't done so already, and uh, we'll make sure you get an account. Great. So I hope to see everyone here on the webinar out there during that reporting window of the 5th to the 19th, um, you know, to report with both water chestnut and jumping worm. Um, but of course, you're encouraged to do it outside those that time frame. So, um, you know, please utilize IMAP. It's such a great tool, and it really helps a lot of those, um, you know, folks in the invasive species field um, get an idea of where these species are located. So. 
Um, yeah, and if any questions, again, don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys.